Good evening, everybody, and you're all very welcome to Trast and Atira this evening. Hope you're all keeping well out there. Um, this evening, I'm thrilled to be joined by uh, Sean Murray, all the way from Belfast. Sean is an independent filmmaker. Uh, he's made a number of short films that reflect both the social and the political landscape of Belfast with a view to particularly re redressing some of the historic events um, that have taken place during the recent conflict in Ireland. So tonight, Sean joins us to discuss his recent documentary. Uh, it was recently sc screened on RT a number of weeks ago and has been in the media since. Uh, the title of that documentary is Unquiet Graves. Sean, you're very welcome to Trust in the Tira. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. So I suppose we'll, we'll begin. I, I think it's, it's best to maybe lay out the format. So what I'm going to do tonight is speak about the, the genesis of the film, how the film came about, speak about the filmmaking process uh, and the journey with the families, uh, and then, of course, speak about the, the continuing impact of the film, as we've seen over this last, the, the, the media interest over this last number of weeks. So I, I had always wanted to, to make an overarching story on collusion. Uh, and I think for me that, that had to have some scholarly foundations to it. I know that the Glen Ann series of killings for me was one of the biggest that I had known of. Uh, and I'd always wanted to do something around that, you know. So it wasn't just about getting a particular subject or a particular, particular instance uh, uh, around collusion. It was about having, a, 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 as I say, a scholarly uh, foundation to it. Uh, and, and I explored uh, doing a, a PhD at the same time and actually begun a, a PhD on, on these issues at the same time as we, we began filming uh, on Quiet Graves. So what, 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 how I see film, and how I see film as an advocacy tool is to address the issues that may already be there, the, whatever issues you're dealing with, and is to further investigate those issues, but more importantly, it's about bearing witness for victims. And what I had intended to do uh, with the PhD and for the film, and it was, it was about both the academic work and the film and forming each other. And that's what happened over the four years of filmmaking. And to give it the international context, I had looked at a number of international filmmakers, particularly in their roles in galvanizing international support around the issues in particular countries. So I looked at Patricio Guzman in Chile, I looked at Joshua Oppenheimer and the work that he had done in Indonesia, uh, my friend Colin McRae and the work that he had done in Sri Lanka, the Killing Foods of Sri Lanka. So, it was about getting an international context that and bringing that all together and what I was doing here in Ireland. You know. So as I say, with these, the, the, have, having us underpinned with, with academic work, it wasn't just about the human rights filmmaking that I was involved in. It was interdisciplinary. So I had to draw together uh, a lot of academic language from political science, from criminology and sociology. And, and, and match that with the documentary theory that I, I was... Uh, I have been starting uh, And of course, if I was ever to do a film on the Glen Ann gang, uh, it was to, first of all, approach uh, Ann Cadwallader. So it was really, I'd made my mind up once I had read Lethal Allies. For me, it was uh, a, a momentous, uh, I think, time in, in, in post-conflict society where we had a book here that was, I, I think it was, it was a staple of looking at the overall, and the overall, uh, overall arching collusion in, in many cases. As I say earlier, it was the, for me, the, the, the magnitude of the, not only the, the, the killings in the Glen Ann series, but those that were involved, the policemen uh, and the UDR men, et cetera. And of course, British military intelligence. So it was first of all, what I intended to do, I asked on, could I meet with the Pat Finucane Center and Margaret, from justice for God, meeting the families then. So I'd impressed upon the families what I'd hoped to do uh, over the next couple of years with the film. I didn't really anticipate that the film would have taken so long to make, but there were a number of issues with that. I think the big one was, was finance and, and actually getting to do what we, we really wanted to do with the film. I didn't want this to be a conventional documentary in any sense. And what I mean by that is a lot of the record the first programs that were done around collusion, besides them concentrating uh, on uh, the bad apple theory uh, around what was happening with collusion. I wanted this film to be uh, a film that looked at systemic collusion, at the, over, the overall uh, 
many facets that were involved, particularly around the, the, the Glen Ann series of killings. So it was about then trying to garner uh, international support. I, I met a number of international organizations, a number of organizations in America. And of course, the filmmaking process then began. Uh, as I say, I didn't anticipate the film to take four years. Finance was a big thing. We just couldn't get the money together. We'd organized a, a fundraiser at the beginning of the uh, pre-production process, which actually got us on our feet, I think. But as, as time went on, uh, it was just about sort of stopping filming, regroup, and trying to find uh, as, as much money as we could from whatever avenues. That obviously came from, particularly from uh, family members, friends of family members, businessmen uh, within those communities. I think over 70%, over 75% of the film actually came from my own production company. So I had to wait till we got some money in for other jobs and, and, and we, we, we took it from there. I think we could have uh, completed the film a lot earlier, but I think it was about getting the right people involved. Uh, much of the crew, and in fact, most of the crew worked for nothing over four years. I think there was a real social and political commitment to a lot of people who were involved in the film. And of course, I think it was about getting, as I say, getting the right people. I, I've always wanted to get Stephen Ray involved, particularly for, for the narration. And, and I think when he came on board to give us a, give us a wee boost. I also, as I said, didn't want to make a conventional documentary. So I was a big fan of, of a guy called Peter Strain, whose animation is just, you know, as we've seen in the film, is, is, is outstanding. And what I, 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 I had hoped to do once more was the next pot of money that we could hopefully raise was to go for the animation. And that, I think that took us another year once we had went to that because there's a lot of fine detail in the work that Peter does. And it was, uh, it was very, very important that we waited on, on, on getting the money for that and waited on, on Peter to, to go about doing his work. So June, uh, sorry, May 2018, the, we had finished the, the final edit in the film. And I think it was a very emotional occasion once we had organized the two screenings, the families, they were, these were private screenings. And for me to get the, the vindication of the families in, the, in those screenings was, 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 was very, very dramatic. It was something that was, was very, very emotional, very, very special. We had had a screening in Moy in, in June 2018 and six days later, we had a screening in Pierce Street in Dublin with the, those who were affected by the uh, Glen Arm Gang and, and the Silver Band. Then the next month, July, we had the, the big screening at Galway Film Festival, which was, uh, it got us a lot of a media attention around the film, I think, but the most important thing to come out of that was we were approached by RTE, can't read about Charlie Flanagan the said last night, we were trying to halt the film. I think one of the things we had spoke to about, the, or what I had spoke to with the families was we weren't interesting, interested in broadcasters, I think, with the proliferation of digital and social media now, we could bypass all that and we didn't need to worry about those broadcasters, mainly because we weren't interested in being editorially controlled by those uh, types of broadcasters. So the Pool Focus uh, Film Festival is a documentary film festival run by the Belfast Film Festival. Uh, and we closed that festival, which is a, a big thing for a, a documentary to do. Uh, I had the eminent criminologist uh, Phil Scraton on board, who uh, done a lot of uh, work in, in, in promoting the film uh, once we got to that stage. And of course, closing the festival to 380 people was, was very, very special. I think what, what, what was most significant uh, with closing that festival was the, the, the media attention that was around that. And for me, it was very, very surprising because uh, the media attention from unionist newspapers was very, very muted. I didn't expect that because I was gauging what would happen uh, as to the release of 66 days and uh, no stone unturned uh, the year before, where we'd seen a complete, completely different reaction to those two films. And here we have an article by Ben Lurie about the no stone unturned film with the title, the film warned isn't telling the, the, the truth. Uh, isn't so I can't see that, move that over. I mean, the whole side of the story about IRA terror. So here was, was a, a media piece on the film No Stone Unturned, which should have been concentrating actually on the families and what had happened around the, the Logan Island massacre. And we have a headline which is, is, is veering the audience towards IRA terror. And that's the, the kind of articles that we were 
expanding once on quiet grace came out. But as I say, it was very, very muted, and I was very, very surprised by it. So another issue that we had with the release of 66 Days uh, and No Son Unturned was this issue of, of uh, funding. Something we expected also attendant uh, material uh, We Here we have the, the Ted Unis out there as public money used to fund the Bobby Sands early hunger strike film. And of course, this was uh, galvanized by a number of statements by unionist politicians. But here we have Sally Wilson. And if I just read that, it says, I'm sure other unions and even plenty of non unionists will agree with me that they really think it's a good idea to have a, a good way of spending public money to keep on storing the path about the past. This strikes at the case that license fee money should not be compulsory, especially that it is being abused in this way. So films that were attempting for the first time to platform marginalized voices were being framed uh, as being abused in the financial sense, that these were somehow not, not, not due to be afforded the, the platform that the BBC or many of the institutional broadcasters would be giving other people uh, during the conflict and, and, and a post-conflict society. So the BBC's response to that was uh, BBC stated that it sought to reflect the differing views and experiences of local communities across its range of programming. Some of this includes troubles, events and legacies. A spokeswoman, <coughs> spokeswoman declared all of it is carried out with the utmost care and sensitivity and 66 days forms part of this wider and still developing BBC programme portfolio. So we even got a BBC statement on the remarks by Sammy Wilson. And of course, NI Screen similarly uh, spoke about the, this intervention is designed to encourage local production companies. And I can't see the rest of that, sorry, because of what's going on. If I just move this here. But I'm sure your readers, can your readers see the full screen there? Am I yeah, we can, the full we can screen? see that, that's fine, Sean, yeah. Yeah, so basically we had the validation from, from both NI Screen and BBC, who sort of, for the first time, I think it was historic and challenging these kind of assertions by unionist commentators. And of course, this only came, uh, Sammy Wilson's statement only came one day after uh, the arts funding was cut by 500,000. Uh, and which was a, a very uh, momentous occasion in, in, in the, the, the political scene uh, in, in the north of Ireland at the time. Of course, we had Martin McGuinness's resignation uh, not long after that. So the cinema run began on the 1st of March 2019. This was a number of months after we began those, uh, the, the, the festival circuit, if you'd like, and Pulse Focus Film Festival and the Galway Film Festival, etc. So we had a, a, a five week run at the QFT, which is a record for a, a film at the, the, the time. Uh, audiences began to pack out independent cinemas and it began to get legs. The film began to uh, create a kind of, a, a, of atmosphere and many people were speaking about the film and the media, uh, the attention was, was still there. Uh, this is a, a, a photo of the Irish Film Institute one of our most prestigious institutions and in, in, in local film in Ireland. And that sold out for a couple of nights, which was, uh, which was a, a, a great thing for, for myself and the families. And of course, at the same time, we began to run advocacy screenings. So we had uh, dozens and dozens of screenings right across local communities in Ireland uh, and England, etc., which were packed uh, to, to, to the many community halls, uh, many small local cinemas. We're beginning to pack out and, and the film was getting a, a lot of attention no matter where it went. We were also approached by the Irish Film and, and Television Academy, which was, was something that to me was very, very surprising because usually an institution like this would kind of veer off from controversial films like On Quiet Grace, but of course we were happy uh, that, that this did, did occur. And of course we have Margot Harkin here, who was an eminent Irish filmmaker, uh, and she came down and was involved in the Q&A with myself afterwards. And again, uh, as the film began to uh, get some media attention, we had uh, a lot of radio shows and, 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 and uh, TV interviews. Uh, this is a picture of a TV interview with RT. But it also began to talk to distributors about the film uh, and about screening the film in a number of satellite uh, companies. So we had... Uh, Journeyman Pictures had came on board and they endeavored to get the film out to as many channels uh, around the world at that time. Then, of course, the international tour, uh, we, we began the tour in Rome. 
which then moved to America. We met a number of uh, government officials in Washington, D.C., uh, before meeting at the National Press Club. We met with uh, a number of Republican and, and, and Democratic uh, political leaders in America. And as, 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 as much support as possible uh, within, within the states around the issues that were, were in the film. I think without that support, I don't think we would have got the, the attention that we would have got uh, internationally. And I think that's a great, I always, always would uh, give a great thanks to the people that were, that were involved in that. And of course, you met with the Irish Embassy in Washington, D.C. also before we uh, moved on to Canada. This is a picture of a, a cinema in Toronto where it sold out in Toronto for, for two nights. Uh, these, these screenings that were in North America were split between me and Alan Bracknell. Alan's father was, was of course, uh, killed by the Glen Allen gang uh, in Silver Bridge. And I think that we began, there were that many screenings that were, were being added to the tour that we had to split towards the end. So Alan took a, over a number of cities while I, I moved on. I, I then moved to Australia with a film where it was being platformed by the Irish Film Festival in Australia. What struck me most about these, these screenings was it didn't matter where I, we, we were screening the film, whether that was Sydney, Manchester, Glasgow, New York, Canada. Members, family members who were affected by the Glen Ann gang began to turn up at screenings. This is a picture of the, the, uh, Patricia Devlin, whose, whose mother and father were killed, and Patricia herself was, was seriously injured by the Glen Ann gang. And it was obviously a, a, a great occasion to meet Patricia in, in Sydney. Her brother Eamon also appeared at the Manchester screening. Uh, we also had people like Sean McLean who spoke at the screening in, in Glasgow. And this was repeated around a number of, of cities around the world. I think it was also an, uh, another momentous occasion in the uh, Cantor uh, movie house in New York City where we, city where we had Nolo Dowd who was uh, involved in the Q&A with himself and all spoke about his own personal, uh, give, give his own testimony about what happened to his two brothers and his uncle uh, in, in, in uh, January 1976. That was the same night as the three Reedy brothers were, were killed also. And as I say, there were, there were notable screenings that we can always look back at. There were uh, Silver Bridge where uh, Alan Bracknell's father was killed. We had 750 people uh, turn up at the GA club in, in, in Silver Bridge. I mean, it was a, a powerful night. And it was just, it was not only about having these screenings in the local community, it was a cathartic process for people. It was like, a, 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 in many ways, a kind of closure after all these years that a lot of these families are vindicated by the issues that were in the, the, the film. And it was a great night for people to come together and speak about those events. This is a picture of the rock bar. The rock bar, as you'd seen in the film on Quiet Graves, was attacked with all those attackers being members of the RUC. And for to come back to that bar and screen the film in that bar, uh, two different nights actually, was something that was very, very special. Uh, I remember a barman, once we were setting up, there was only a couple of people in the bar, and the barman saying, don't underestimate what this means to this local community, to this film to come back to you. And of course, in November, the, the film won the RTS award. And again, that was vindication of the, 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 many, uh, the many hard days that we put into the film, and particularly with the families, and, and to, to, to be able to share that night with Alan Bracklin and, and, and uh, Anne Pedwala there was again something that was very, very special. So moving on to the RTE broadcast, uh, the public reaction to the RT broadcast. Now, there, there, there are two reasons for, for, for the way that, or the, the irate reaction from some uh, to the RT broadcast was, first of all, was the scale of the public reaction. I don't think that was expected by many of the detractors of the film. And, and, and also the fact that RT, an actual broadcaster, would be screening the film. I don't think that they expected that. I think that the muted response was something that was calculated at the very, very start when the film was originally released in 2018. But I don't think they were able to hold that back once the broadcaster was, able, was 
uh, definitely involved in screening the film, which we'd seen on the 16th of September this year. So I think the public uh, reaction to the film, the scale of the public reaction to the film just uh, wasn't able, there, there were some that weren't able to hold those criticisms back as we had seen. And I think if I have to chart some of this criticism, I have to chart back to actually uh, a night in the Con Club on the 5th of September, 2018, uh, where we had uh, a unionist gathering. We had Mervyn Gibson from the Orange Order. We had Doug Beatty from the Ulster Unionist Party and a number of other unionists. And what we had seen on that night was ad hominem attacks on me in the film, which have been recycled and repeated. Uh, other uh, assertions that I was attempting to re rewrite history. Uh, and I responded to this with an, artic with an, an article that was published uh, in the Unionist Voice. I wouldn't usually do that, but I thought with the, ver the, 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 the variation of people that were on that panel that, that, I, that it was due a rate of reply. And for, for those, and what I had written in that article, which is available online, is that you know, any assertions that I was attempting to rewrite history must come from a place of privilege. Um, I mean, like would someone like myself um, from a working class area in West Belfast, why would I be making films? Uh, or why would I not be making films, sorry, about Shankill Road and Le Mans, et cetera? I, I, for me, it's particularly surprising that, that something like that would be brought up. I mean, if you're involved in film, no matter what type of film it is, you speak from the heart, you speak from a, particularly if you're involved in documentary, you speak about where you've come from, social and political issues that have affected you and affected your community. So I don't think I'd be doing any justice if I was involved in making films for another community, which I, I, I knew little to nothing about. So in my response, and I try to quantify uh, quantify uh, the assertion that no films were made about, this is something that was said on the platform, that no films were made about the likes of Le Mans and, 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 and Shanghai, et cetera. And what I'd done, I, I'd set out to quantify how absurd suggestion was. But first of all, I already knew that there were many films made about other atrocities. Uh, but I'd quantified exactly how many of those films were made. And what I had done is I'd laid out 674 documentaries that would be considered pro-state or anti-Republican uh, or, 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 or uh, anti, sorry, pro-state in the sense that we didn't have any marginalized voices uh, speaking in those films, people from my own community or people that were affected by state violence. And then I had listed 22 documentaries that could be considered anti-state. So those were about the killings of Pat Vermeulen, uh, the shoot to kill policies in the 1980s, et cetera, plastic bullet killings. And, and, and to quantify that, to get that figure of 674 documentaries against 22 was a way that, of course, would say that's anyone who would try to say that there was an imbalance because a couple of uh, documentaries had been made uh, against the state or, or, or had highlighted uh, uh, instances of state violence. Then, of course, we had seen the backlash after the RTE scheme. Here's a, an article by Owen Horace that I'd asked for a right of reply and I was eventually given. Uh, and, and much of this criticism was verbatim, it was more or less copy, copy and paste of, of, of what the newsletter had initially been doing uh, over the, a number of days after the RT screening. So sorry, the first uh, main premise and one that began, began to be recycled was the integrity of John Weir, who had spoken the documentary, The Whistleblower. And again, what I had done with the rate of reply to the Sunday Independent was list who had said the, who list who, the, the, the number of people who had deemed John Weir to be credible. Most notably, Judge Barn, who had said that John Weir was credible. The Guardian investigators that uh, interviewed John Weir had said that he was a, a, an intelligent and discerning man and a convincing witness. And of course, an independent, independent panel of academic experts and judge led Orcus Committee. <laughs> inquiry uh, stated that there were corroborating, corroborating evidence into no fewer than 11 murders from John Weir. Now, for me to use John Weir as a whistleblower in the film was the first time that we had seen this kind of irate reaction to this. Uh, and of course, I'd use these, this, these, uh, this information 
to the rate of reply uh, in the Sunday Times. And again, Charlie Flanagan, of course, the criticism that we've seen from Charlie Flanagan, which, which uh, got a lot of media uh, attention over this last number of weeks. This is a statement from, uh, from Charlie Flanagan about the finance of the film. I used to be a solicitor and someone came to me with a bag of money. The issue would not be so much of where the house was, but where the money had came from. And first of all, I think it would have been prudent for, for, for Charlie Flanagan to contact the production company, my production company that made the film. I was never at any stage contacted by uh, Charlie Flanagan or many of the art attractors of the film. And for someone, I think, of Charlie Flanagan's caliber to come off with something and, be, be, uh, and attempt to smear me personally and smear the production was very, very ill-informed. I was very, very surprised at that. I, 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 and, and also, uh, what I was surprised at was the language that was used by Charlie Flanagan was almost copy and paste that I'd seen in the preceding days beforehand uh, of some unionist uh, commentators. And once we had seen that by Charlie Flanagan, then we had seen a number of, of, of commentators uh, giving quite, quite defamatory statements, particularly if we try and frame what had happened after the, the screening of RT and the attacks that were ad hominem attacks on myself and on the production. In the middle of all this, nobody was talking about the content within the film. Uh, nobody was talking about the insensitivities to those that were affected by the issues in the film, the families. And of course, we have uh, a, 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 a very prominent commentator saying it shows that they did arrest Jackson and might have got a conviction if she had been able to hold herself together. And I thought that was just extraordinary. If anyone had seen on Quiet Graves and had seen the personal testimony that Margaret Campbell have, have, that would have given in that film, for me to make that statement is just incredible. And of course, this uh, particular, commentator, particular commentator wasn't the only one. We've seen just this week that another prominent commentator said, the so-called Glen Ann gang, and all were arrested and convicted for their, 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 their crimes. And of course, this is untrue. There were only a number of, um, of those convicted, of IUC men, EDR men convicted. And if we take the figure of 120 plus civilians that were killed by the Glen Ann gang, there's only a very, very small proportion of people. Before we even speak about the systemic collusion and the spooks that were involved in the killings also. So how do we frame all this? How, how do we look at all the the criticism that has come about, particularly since the uh, RTE screening. When we look at this, there, there is no doubt we can't uh, look back at, at Section 31. We, can't, we, have, we have to contextualize this on Section 31 and the UK broadcasting ban. Section 31 uh, ran from 1971 to 1984. And for me, this, the, the proponents of this type of censorship which happened uh, in the south of Ireland and also would be the same detractors that we have seen coming out of the woodworks over this last number of weeks. So for me, this isn't just about criticism of the film. This is about these same people uh, attempting to repress those, those marginalized voices that were at the bottom of that mon of monopoly of victimhood over many, many years. What they're saying is, is that these types, these, these people, these victims, should know their place. And filmmakers like me from West Belfast should know my place. We shouldn't be able to get that kind of platform uh, that, that, that these same uh, commentators and media organizations have had during the conflict and have had since the Good Friday Agreement. And I think that, that with this, what we've seen over this last number of weeks, this is what this is really about. Any questions? Hi, Sean. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. I, I have a couple of questions and probably a few more uh, that will be coming through there over the over the chat. So if you have any questions for Sean, just pop them into the chat box. Um, Sean, one from myself, just after looking at the documentary again over the weekend, and uh, thanks for sending it on. I was kind of struck by the, I suppose, that the ongoing reconciliation process that's been there in the north and um, what a lot of commentators would describe as the importance of truth as being, I suppose, a foundation stone on, on, on top of which that re reconciliation process 
is built. Would you have any comment on that about the importance of these type of documentaries in, in, in terms of becoming a foundation for the ongoing reconciliation process in the North? I don't think it's so much as about the, the process of, of, of reconciliation. I think that, you know, that, that ship sailed after the Good Friday Agreement. We, did, we didn't deal with that properly. There was no, you know, we, we, we particularly unionists in the British state, didn't want to become involved in a, in a, in a, a truth and reconciliation uh, uh, commission, particularly because they didn't want the narrative around the conflict to change. So that notion, even at the good, during the, the negotiations for the Good Friday Agreement, agreement wasn't, wasn't there. So this is really about those institutional feelings, uh, those institutions that really should have been dealing or should have been put, putting in an awful lot more effort in the reconciliation. What this film is saying, we've bypassed that now. If you're not going to deal, even through the criminal justice system, deal effectively with the issues and what has, that these families have been through, then we're going to tell our own stories about what had happened. And we're going to do that on an international platform. We're not going to, we're not going to wait for broadcasters to do it. I think once you, we have seen a number of broadcasters in these last couple of years, like the BBC and RT coming on board now and screening these films, I think they're falling in behind us because they know that we can bypass that now with the proliferation of digital and social media. So I think it's, it's, not, it's not so much about becoming involved in the process of reconciliation because of course this film is going to, is, is going to divide people, but it's, the, the stories from those that are affected by state violence shouldn't undermine those that are affected by IRA violence or NLA violence. We shouldn't undermine each other's stories. We should just tell our stories. And this is what confuses me so much, so much about the irate reaction, reaction sorry, from some within uh, the, the local media here in the North and of course in the South. So, I mean, I think the time for, and the discussions around, around reconciliation, I, I, for me, it was it was more about telling the stories of the you know of of of, of those who are most marginalised because it's all they have now. The criminal justice system has failed them in many ways. Uh, they are getting minor slow victories in that sense, but here we have unquiet graves. We have Margaret Irwin, Ir Irwin's book. We have uh, Anne Cadwallader's book, and these are all our case. That are going to be there forever. They're test. They're 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 testament to the the lives of of all those that were affected by the violence. Thanks, Sean. I, I have a question in there from uh, Kieran Tierney, and uh, his question is really around the families of, of the victims, uh, and in this case, around Lachlan Island, uh, Miami Show Band, and he's really asking. How did you integrate the families? Did they have an input into this filmmaking process? Well, when I had met the families uh, in, in Benburg four years ago, that's when we had the, the large family gathering. We had one in Dublin and we had one uh, in Benburg for North and, and South of the border. So what I'd say to the families is that we, we obviously couldn't have everyone's stories within the film. So I'd, I would be picking out a number of instances and a number of tax attacks by the Glen Allen gang and there would be a certain number of interviewees uh, in the film. So in regards to the, the creator, I said, but what we, what we would do, you know, one story, one person's story is gonna be everyone's story. Uh, and as you'd seen in the screen in an RT, at the end of the film, you had everyone's name who was, who was uh, uh, murdered by the, the Glen Allen gang. So in regards to the creative process, uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't input from the families in the creative process, but there was, uh, conduit between Pat Finucan Centre and the, uh, the Justice for the Forgotten of Margaret Irwin. So it was a very, very sensitive uh, time in filmmaking and everything was done sensitively. And of course, if none of the family members weren't, weren't happy with anything, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have went through with it. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Um, I have a question in from uh, Jerry Goff. Um, it's, his question is around conservatives seem hell-bent on protecting uh, British Army and security forces who have committed crimes and murder in Ireland during the conflict. How do we as a society, I think he means, tackle that? Uh, through our activism. 
through our activism and through our politics on the ground, I think that starts at a grassroots level. I think we're beginning to see increasingly that the work at a grassroots level spreads uh, right up. And I think that goes for the same as my activist filmmaker. You, 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 have to, you have to begin to acknowledge that once we start this at grassroots, you galvanize uh, other people into doing that. And what I, I mean, there's people that, that influenced me in my filmmaking. I look back at, at, at Arthur McKeag, who was a, a great activist filmmaker in the 1980s. His, his, his films would have been widely known at the time. But he's, he was a man from New Jersey uh, who lived in Paris and made uh, documentaries about the North. He made a documentary in 1979 called The Patriot Game and a documentary in 1988 uh, called Irish, Irish Ways, which I think both can be uh, found or, or bits, bits of both films can be found on YouTube, etc. But it, that, it, it, for me, Arthur McKay was, was a, a great influence because here I'd seen someone who who had you know, marginalized voices speak in their documentaries. And, and me, as a child, seeing my own community speak on film, I mean, you had to hide these documentaries, you had to hide these films from the British soldiers that were raiding our houses. I remember one time that uh, the British soldiers came into the house and they were going through videotapes. And the Arthur McKeague documentary, Irish Ways, was 40 minutes into the videotape and the documentary began. And for the first 38 minutes, it was cast with a ghost. And these British army guys are putting these videos in to look for like propaganda videos. They weren't really propaganda videos. They were just, they were just documentaries that shown people in my area speak about, you know, issues, economic, social issues, political issues that affected them. And me as a chain having that power and that sense over that British soldier who, who kept putting these, these films and not knowing that, you know, halfway through these, these, these movies, these Arthur McKeague's films were about to start. And it was just that, that sense of empowerment. Give me... Uh, it really influenced me. And of course, another one documentary would have been the, uh, the Death on the Rock documentary by Thames Television after the, the killings in Gibraltar. It was just something that really stuck with me because Margaret Thatcher had tried to stop it. And I'd seen the power of investigative journalism in that. Uh, and, and of course, Roger, Roger Bolton almost lost his career over that. Uh, Thames Television eventually lost their license over that three years later. So it stuck with me that the power of documentary and the power of testimony. Thanks, Sean. Uh, there's a question in there from Paddy Cullivan and we well, a couple of questions, but uh, the one I'll ask here is that uh, a lot of people, particularly uh, down here in the 26 counties, were amazed that RTE actually broadcasted that documentary. Uh, do you think there is a sea change in thinking or are RTE starting to cater for a new, new audience? Well, I, Daphne, I think it was, it was historic. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people would agree with me that it was a, a story to, to, to screen on quiet graves. I just think that, as I'd mentioned earlier, that these, these films now are unstoppable. You know, the voices of those that we had seen in Unquiet Graves are not going away. Uh, and I think th those voices are louder by the fact that institutions have tried to silence these voices and, and, and have never given them the same platform as those that were affected by Republican violence during the conflict. And that's why we see this, this the, the, these, vo these voices are louder and that they're being platforms to a wider international audience, you know? Thanks, Sean. And uh, when I had myself over, over this, the second time I looked at the documentary, in terms of uh, the, the, the two governments, in terms of the, uh, the government we have here in the 26 counties and in terms of the British government, what level of knowledge was there at senior government level uh, on, on both governments as to the level of collusion involved, in your opinion? Well, in my opinion, I think, we're, let, let's take the British government for a start. I think there was no doubt that that ran to the top, and that just wasn't in the 1970s. You know, this, this definitely happened during sh the shoot to kill policies in the 1980s uh, and, and further afield. I have no doubt that it went to the top. I think in, in regards what had happened in the South of Ireland, uh, the establishment governments in the South of Ireland. I, I don't know. I think there are a number of people that are there today could actually answer that question. Uh, I don't like to speculate too much, but why are all the feds in regards to the Dublin Monaghan bombings? Why will they not be released? That's, that's something that sticks, sticks with me and something that I think that people in the South should be a lot angry about. Thanks, Sean. And, and we've seen it ourselves here in, in the last number of days with a proposal to 
uh, lock away the files from the two mother and babies home. So um, there, I think there's there's on, on both governments, there's a reluctance to face up to some of the, the demons of the past. Sean, I've loads of other questions there. I've another 37 questions. I'm, I'm not going to get to them. I'd like to thank you for uh, doing the documentary. Thank you for coming on Fast and the Tira tonight and sharing your knowledge with us. We all really enjoyed it uh, and keep up the good work. Slong of